Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, dear moderator and co-panelists, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about this very uh, important topic in the time and place in which we live. Before I begin, I'd like to uh, apologize because I, I'm going to be brief. I have to be at the Syria rally in downtown Chicago in just a few minutes. I have to start to, to leave. So I apologize in advance for not being uh, around to hear Norman, who I really appreciate hearing online. And this would have been the first time for me to hear him, hear him in person. And I really regret the fact that I can't do that. Um, but I'm sure that the question and answer session will be more than taken care of with these wonderful speakers. Let me begin by saying that the internet is a tool. And the reason why I say that is because when it comes to the question of is the internet good or bad, is it wrong or right, is it haram or halal, when we say it's a tool, like any other tool, television or radio or the phone, you know, the internet, whatever, the internet is a tool meaning that it can be used for good purposes or bad purposes. It's not haram or halal in of itself. It's not wrong or right in of itself. It's not good or bad in of itself. It depends on how you use it. Now, my interest in talking to you here is not about internet use or Facebook use, but rather internet activism and Facebook activism. And I would argue, and I'll give you the reasons, that the internet, including Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, Activism on that front, on that platform, is an obligation upon us Muslims who care about our faith, about the image and the reality of our faith, and the image and the reality of our community. And here's why. More than any other medium of communication in the world today, including television and radio, mobile phones, in-person speeches, you name it, the Internet has the widest spread audience in the fastest time possible. It's the cheapest form of communication, it's effective, and it's personalized. Now, when we talk about the importance of the Internet, Facebook is one such platform on the Internet that is important, and here's why. Listen to these facts. These are statistics. They're very interesting. As of 2001, 2011, sorry, there are 500 million active users on Facebook. 500 million. That's one in every 13 human beings on Facebook. Half of those people are logged in every single day. That's one in every 26 people on Earth. They're logged in constantly on Facebook. 48%, that's almost 50% of 18 to 34 year olds check Facebook right when they wake up. Now about 28%, that's almost you know, a third, check their Facebook on their smartphones before getting out of bed. The 35 plus demographic now represents more than 30% of the entire user base. The 18 to 24 college demographic grew the fastest at 74% in one year. Now there are 206.2 million internet users in the U.S. That means 71.2% of the U.S. web-based audience is on Facebook. That's over two-thirds of every American is on Facebook. About 70% of the Facebook user base resides outside of the United States. You also have an international audience. Now Facebook was the most searched term in 2010 for the second year running when you think about the possibility of terms that you can search on the internet with all of the you know, hundreds of millions of users around the world, it gives you an indication of how popular Facebook is. Combined, Facebook-related searches accounted for 3.48% of the total of the top 50 searches of 2010, a 207% jump from 2009. Now here's one that's really mind-boggling. 57% of people, that's more than half, talk to people more online than they do in real life. So there are more people on earth that talk to other people online than they do in real life. Now, some of this is really scary, but there's an opportunity in that as well. 48% of young Americans said that they find out about news through Facebook, not through CNN, not through the BBC, not through radio or television, through the internet and specifically the user interface and user-run 
Facebook, the virtual community of people. Now, a record-breaking 750 million photos were uploaded to Facebook over New Year's weekend. That's just one weekend, 750 million photos. So you can see these astronomical numbers. And you can imagine the opportunity that rests in that platform in terms of influence, in terms of us getting the word out on that which we deem important and significant to our lives, in this case, our religion, our faith, our community. And here's why this is important, and we talked about this in a morning session, in a morning breakfast, no man was there. I submit to you that the success of Islamophobia in the West is the failure of Muslims online. I'll repeat that. The success of Islamophobia in the West is the failure of Muslims online. That is because a great number of some of the worst rhetoric, stereotypes, arguments that are fabricated against Islam and Muslims begin on the Internet and do not make it into the mainstream. They begin in the periphery of the Internet even. And they don't make it into the mainstream of the Internet or the mainstream of other public media like television and radio until they've found success in the Internet. So it's almost like a breeding ground and a testing ground of Islamophobic material. And that's where we allow it to run loose without response, without reputation. Because while Muslims are relatively weak online, anti-Muslims and Islamophobes are pretty strong online and they're pretty well organized. They're spending a lot of money. They're organized, they're mobilized. They have a clear strategy, clear agenda. And while we may play the victim role, we may complain about that, we do little to stand up against that in a systemized, sustainable manner. There are so many blogs run by individuals, individual Islamophobes and anti-Muslims, from the basement of their homes that are ten times as popular as their largest American Muslim organizational website, including ISNA, CARE, and MPAC. Some are a hundred times more popular. That means they reach a hundred times more people on any given day or any given hour. Now, when you combine that with the fact that our organizational websites tend to be, you know, cut and dry because it's an organizational website. It's not going to be the most interesting thing in the world. It's going to have an event. It's going to have a summary of some event, uh, an upcoming event. It's going to have, uh, you know, a press release, etc. Whereas with the blogs, you have videos, you have um, real-time comments and material, you have arguments that actually take the time to build up an idea and to try to persuade you about this idea. So you have this wide reach and you have the intensity of the material, combine the two and you have a much more influential result than you do with our organizational websites. Now mind you, we have tens of thousands of activists in these organizations. We're spending millions of dollars and here you have individuals who probably don't spend that much money. Now we have a role to play, each and every one of us. The moderator mentioned my Facebook stats. That's not a statement of my popularity to the world or my importance to the world. That's a statement on the importance of Facebook to me and how I wanted to cultivate presence on Facebook because of my Facebook activism. Because I wanted to use it as a tool, as a platform to get the word across and I understood that it was very important to my work. I can talk to you now and I'm glad to do that. I'm honored to do that but with all due respect Maybe there's a thousand people in this room, maybe two thousand. If I write a good blog and I market it well on Facebook and Twitter, I could get ten thousand, twenty thousand, or hundred thousand people reading this, the blog and watching the video. And while sometimes, you know, an activist has to travel, you know, hundreds of miles or thousands of miles to go give a speech to, you know, hundred or two hundred people, in the comfort of your home, you can reach that number. So not to discount, you know, person-to-person -person activism and real-world activism, but we cannot for a second believe that that is all we need to do and that this online thing is for those who want to listen to music and share funny videos and comment on social affairs, you know, private personal affairs. It is a platform for activism. It is a place where you can influence people. People are being influenced about Islam and Muslims in the wrong direction, unfortunately, on the Internet, on Facebook, on Twitter, etc., etc., now, there are good examples of Muslims who have come to that conclusion and who are active online with a good result, with real influence. You have, for example, uh, Baba Ali, or Baba Ali, 
who runs, I believe, Umma Films, a very successful enterprise, a very creative enterprise, from a room in his apartment. He has a, you know, a makeshift studio. He has the right lighting. He has a nice, crisp camera. He's an engaging, charismatic personality. He's got a sense of humor. He's presentable. He comes on for these very short videos. He has a theme. He talks about it. He engages the audience. As a result of his presentation and the accessibility of the Internet and the platform that all these hundreds of millions of users around the world can see, he's able to get so many videos across to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And you see the comments, how influential he is, how he's able to change minds about Islam and Muslims. One man from his apartment. Also, another man, uh, Khan, I, I, don't, I don't remember his first name, but Khan Academy, if somebody knows his name. Um, Khan Academy run by Mr. Khan, can't remember his first name. What's that? That is basically a website that has YouTube videos that are essentially tutorials on various subjects for students from grade 1 to grade 12. And all of the various subjects. This individual has the talent and the skill of being able to explain things. He was actually, I think, a hedge fund manager on Wall Street. And then his uh, niece, I believe it was, asked help on a math assignment. He explained it to her. She understood it like this. She's like, wow, all these teachers could have explained it to me. And now I get it. So he felt like, wow, I could do more of this. So he created a couple of YouTube videos, put them online. They were extremely successful, did more, ended up doing the entire math syllabus, then moved to science, then moved to history, moved to all these other subjects, and then decided to do this full time. And he quit his very well-paying you know, Wall Street position. And in his own home, in a little closet area, built this new office for this new enterprise, Khan Academy. And today he has more students graduating from his tutorials than Harvard University. And is considered one of the most successful websites in terms of uh, tutorials and education in the world. And I believe he was recognized by Bill Clinton in the Clinton Initiative and by Al Gore. You know, all sorts of media, New York Times front page. I mean, he's become a phenomenon. Again, one individual with a talent and access to the Internet. It doesn't have to be Islamophobia. It doesn't have to be da'wah about Islam and Muslims. Any great contribution to humanity that you can make, like this individual made, you can make in real life and you can also make in a very stunted fashion on Facebook or on the Internet in general, websites, blogs. I think each and every one of us who's serious about representing a cause that they believe in has to consider having a website for that initiative, Maybe a website for yourself, a personal website, like I have AhmadRahab.com. That's my home on the internet. Everything that I do, I put online. Whether it's a speech, there's a YouTube video, if it's an interview on TV, I put it on there. If it's an article that's published, if it's an upcoming event, that's my home online. I'm able this way to communicate with people. People can find my material instantly. I have a blog, it's AhmadRahab.com slash blog. I advise everybody to have a blog, even more so than a website, because that's where you can basically comment on current affairs from your perspective as an educated Muslim and get readers, because blogs actually have, you know, the software that's in the blog is pre-designed to be picked up by Google and other search engines in a way that basic HTML design websites cannot do. I advise everybody to have a Facebook account as an activist, not just to make friends and to do small talk, but to get into the issues. And if not original material, not everybody's an author, not everybody's an analyst, not everybody has political ambitions or political know-how, but you know what you like and you know what you don't like. You know what you read that you like and appreciate. You could at least become a person, you know, an activist who furthers this material along. The way good material gets around is through word of mouth, through word of finger. People are forwarding things to each other. They're liking things. They're retweeting things. So at the very least, that's something you could do, and I guarantee you, you don't need much experience or practice to do something like that. YouTube videos, young students, you're articulate, you're presentable, you're capable. Consider doing like Bob Ali. Consider having a little makeshift studio. You know, put together your own videos. Communicate with your fellow Americans. Communicate with the world. This is the time for us to start talking. If there is a problem in terms of misunderstanding and misperceptions and Islamophobia, it is because we are not talking and we're not doing our job. We will always have enemies. Everybody's going to have enemies. I will not ask my enemies to stop being my enemies. That's what they're there for. I'm going to ask myself and my community to respond, to be there representing who we are. 
We cannot play the victim role. We cannot, you know, sit hand on cheek, wailing and saying, well, oh, you know, they're so powerful and there's so many of them and they're doing this and they're doing that. When we have the same access to the same platforms, it's not a money issue, cheap, affordable. It's just a question of awareness, of vigilance, of strategy, and getting it done. And for those of you who don't know where to get started, I make an offer today. Contact me on my website. I'll be more than happy to act as your private free consultant to hook you up with a blog or a website or a Twitter account or a Facebook account and start chugging away with the information. So at the very least, if you feel that you're busy, if you feel that you don't have time to move around, you will feel that you are a contributing member of our community if at the very least you are active online as an online activist. And trust you me, like I said, that's where it's at in so many different ways. It's not a coincidence that newspapers like the Chicago Tribune are filing for bankruptcy while the most read newspaper in the world does not come out in print. It's the Huffington Post, the digital Huffington Post exclusively online. That's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that the New York Times gets more readers online than it does in print paper. And it's not a coincidence that Facebook is as popular as it is. So in closing, I want to tell you that don't have a taboo attitude about the Internet. Don't be intimidated by the Internet. The Internet is a tool. It's a neutral thing. Depending on how we use it, if someone is using the Internet for gossip, for personal glory, for porn, for whatever, for bullying, obviously that's a bad thing. But that same Internet can be used for everything that you believe in, for dawah, for you know, fighting Islamophobia, for standing up for justice, for interfaith, for bringing people together, for education. And so that is a direction we need to take as Muslims. It's an obligation. That's not a fatwa. It's an opinion. I do hope there's a sheikh out there that can make this fatwa, though. And watch the results. If all of us are engaged, at the very least, comment on things. There are paid commenters on the side of the Islamophobes. And I know what I'm talking about. I've researched this stuff. They're being paid to comment. They go, they have certain keywords. They run around the internet, anywhere they see Islam or Muslims or you know, an activist name or an organizational name, they will, they will publish the same material that's pre-created for them, that is distorting and misguiding, uh, and they will put it right there with links. And as they do more of that, they begin to sabotage the good work that this entity does. And so this entity tries to do more work, but the more it does, it doesn't really matter because it's investing in in non-fertile soil. But if we, were, if we were capable of doing the same thing the other way around, if we were capable of getting our websites and our blogs and our material to be commented upon, to be popular online, that will be the best way to refute that which is wrong about our organizations, our individual activists, our religion, our community. And I want to tell you that everything I've said so far about the internet and Facebook, and all it's not because I'm a software engineer. As a matter of fact, uh, people don't know this, but what I studied in my software engineering has absolutely nothing to do with the Internet. What I learned about the Internet, I learned as a psychology major in undergrad, way before I was a software engineer, and it was essentially through looking at the source code of a page and the actual physical page and comparing them together. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. Thanks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.